Welcome to Indie 101, what will be possibly the first video in a series of explanations about how the game works that are geared toward teaching you, the viewer, how to build better decks, play better games, and maybe have more fun in the process. Today we're talking about deck archetype. A deck's archetype is basically a deck's strategy. I want to start by differentiating between a deck's archetype and a deck's theme. The simplest way to think of it is that a deck's archetype is what the deck's goal is, whereas the deck's theme is how it accomplishes that goal. Archetypes are things like aggro, mid-range control, etc., and themes are things like artifacts, graveyard, and tribal. You could have an artifact aggro deck or a tribal aggro deck. Both of these decks would share some weaknesses and strengths, but the specific themes would make one of them weak to something that the other is not. For example, an artifact aggro deck might have a hard time dealing with a card like Stony Silence, whereas a tribal deck would barely care about it. However, Stony Silence is good against most decks with an artifact theme, even if they are different archetypes. In addition, there are cards that are generally good against decks with a similar archetype, but not good against specific themes. Cards like Supreme Verdict are good against most aggro decks, but don't care about what theme your opponent is playing. Basically, a theme is a set of synergies and cards that play well together, and you can slot those synergies and cards into a whole bunch of different kinds of decks. But those different decks may be different archetypes, and therefore be trying to accomplish a different game plan even if they use a lot of the same cards. So, now that we've explained the difference between archetypes and themes, we need to explain what the different archetypes are and how they work. There are a lot of different archetypes that you can try to separate decks into. However, most decks fit into one of four different archetypes. These biggest archetypes are aggro, mid-range, combo, and control. So we're just going to go over all of these real quick and talk about their strengths and their weaknesses. Starting us off, aggro decks are known for trying to kill their opponent as fast as possible. They usually play a combination of cheap, efficient threats, cheap removal to get blockers out of the way, and maybe a few pieces of card draw to help them when they run out of gas, so to speak. The strengths of aggro are their ability to put a lot of pressure on their opponent very quickly. You can't afford to take turns off not affecting the board against an aggro deck. The weaknesses of an aggro deck are that they have few or no sources of card advantage. The few draw spells they do run, they try to cast near the end of the game to dig for one more threat or burn effect to finish their opponent off. So there's this bit of game theory that I have around different deck archetypes that I haven't seen anyone else put into words, but I think it's very accurate. Each deck archetype tries to win the game from a specific angle. The angle that aggro decks take is tempo or time in the form of turns of the game. There's a reason people talk about the speed of a deck or a strategy. The faster you can kill your opponent, the more you force them to do something. Aggro decks are usually the fastest decks in the game. Aggro decks trade card advantage for tempo. Burn spells are a great example of this. If you think about cards like Lava Spike in terms of card advantage, casting a single Lava Spike leaves you at minus one. However, the Lava Spike that kills your opponent is basically a one-mana card that wins you the game, which is obviously insane value. When you cast a spell that burns your opponent, you're literally throwing away card advantage in order to put more damage out. A great example of this idea of trading card advantage for speed. Because of their emphasis on efficiency and lack of card draw, aggro decks have a very low curves and run the least lands out of any archetype. This has two purposes. One is so that you don't have to wait to cast your card. Aggro decks don't ever want to not be able to play anything because they don't have mana, so they've run very few cards that cause four or more mana, and in older formats they won't even play three mana spells in the main board. The other upside of running so few lands and having such a low curve is that you both are less likely to draw more lands and don't need to. Aggro decks basically want to open two to three lands in their opening hand and only draw one more land ever if that. Top decking a land of the late game or a mid game for non aggro decks can basically be not drawing a card at all that turn if you already have enough lands for all your spells and that land won't let you cast any extra spells on your turn because you're out of cards. Combine this with the fact that aggro decks really, really don't want to give their opponent more time to deploy their more powerful cards and top decking a land late game can be devastating. That pretty well sums up aggro decks, so let's move on to the next archetype. Mid-range decks are a name for medium speed decks. They aren't as fast as aggro or as slow as control, taking a happy medium between the two. Mid-range decks play a good even curve, usually playing cards all the way from 1 mana to 5, and maybe a 6 drop if those cards are really strong in a specific metagame. Mid-range is a really weird deck archetype to talk about because they're incredibly meta-dependent. Mid-range decks will play whatever cards happen to be the best into whatever aggro or control decks happen to be the best at that specific time. This is why taking a mid-range deck from one format and trying to play it in a different format will often lead to disastrous results. Playing a mid-range deck like Modern Jund or Legacy Death and Taxes into a standard deck can lead to either those older decks curb stomping a standard deck with their stronger cards, or them losing horribly as their cards match up poorly with the best cards in that standard format. 
The reason that mid-range decks are like this is that they try to exploit an idea that I like to call card quality to win their game. Card quality is basically the impact that a card has on the game once it's actually brought into play. Card quality is directly proportional to mana cost on almost all magic cards. Now, card quality is very specifically not how good a card is, just how impactful it is when it comes down. A card like Lightning Bolt has less card quality than Palaka Worm, even if the Worm is a much worse card than Lightning Bolt, which is a staple in every format it's printed in. Again, this is because mana cost scales proportionally to card quality. Midrange decks seek to play the highest quality cards available, specifically those that get the most mileage in their specific meta. Midrange decks usually have a really good matchup into aggro decks, as their more powerful cards allow midrange decks to easily block aggro's efficient threats and have their own creatures live. As well as the fact that as aggro is starting to run out of steam in the mid game, midrange decks are just starting to play their best cards. As I say this, I want to very quickly say that this, as well as all of the matchup descriptions I give, will of course be very meta dependent. The more important thing is to know how each deck type beats every other type of deck. Midrange beats aggro by turning the corner on them, surviving the initial onslaught before playing their more powerful threats to close the game. Now, if I had to sum up what the goal of a midrange deck was, it would be to adapt to the board state no matter what it is. Of course, this has to include the board state being completely empty, so midrange decks have to play a lot of good threats as well as play a lot of answers and card advantage pieces. Next up, we have control decks. Control decks try to win the game through card advantage. If you have cards and your opponent doesn't, you're probably going to win because you can actually do things. Control decks play a bunch of removal spells, counter spells, board wipes, and draw spells to grind out long games before winning with a very sticky win condition. Control is the slowest archetype of the bunch, taking the longest to win its games and having often essentially won long before they deal a full 20 damage to their opponent. Control decks often play the most expensive cards of any archetype because they can live long enough to actually cast them. It's not uncommon to see control decks playing 6 or 7 mana spells. Control decks often have a good matchup against midrange because they're able to take the first couple of turns off to set up their game plan and can still easily answer all of midrange's good threats. Control decks are usually very good against combo decks as well, but we'll explain that when we get to combo decks later on. However, control decks often have a hard time with aggro decks as their ability to put out so much early game pressure can force them onto the back foot very quickly, and they have a harder time turning the corner on aggro decks without as many threats to help them stabilize. And the fourth and final biggest archetype is combo. Have you ever heard of the phrase, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts? In the case of combo decks, that phrase is very literal. Combo decks seek to use powerful synergies between cards to make them more powerful than they would be individually. A really good example of this is Kiki Cheeky, Mirror Breaker, and Deceiver Exarch. With both of these cards in play, you can copy the Deceiver with Kiki Cheeky to make a copy of the Exarch, which will untap your Kiki and allow you to repeat the process, producing an infinite number of hasty creatures. This combo and combos like this make just about everything else you can do in the game seem kinda silly by comparison. Combo decks are extremely powerful, but they are weak to interaction. While all of their cards are powerful together, they're often weaker than the average card individually. This means that if you remove a few specific pieces at the right time, you can basically get rid of all of their cards or at least invalidate them. This means that combo decks are usually good against aggro deck, which they can go over the top of really easily, okay against mid-range decks, and usually very bad against control decks who specialize in stopping cards from happening. Now the reason we've waited so long on mentioning combo is because combo has a few sub-archetypes. The first of these sub-archetypes are all-in combo decks. All-in combo decks are essentially the aggro deck of combo decks. They try to combo off as quickly as possible and lose if you stop them. On the other end of the spectrum are control decks with a combo finish. These decks are sometimes just called control decks, but they have the upside of being able to win faster than most control decks, but the downside of being weaker to certain types of removal or interaction. They're kind of a hybrid of the two archetypes. And then there are mid-range combo decks. These are mid-range decks that have a combo in them, but don't actively try to find the combo. The combo just sort of forces the opponent to strain their removal even further, needing to kill key single powerful threats while also needing to remove combo pieces. These decks are basically half combo and half midrange, and have a lot of the best parts of each with the downside that the threats are also usually slightly worse overall. Now that we've covered all the four main archetypes, we can talk about the matchup wheel. You see, the meta in Magic the Gathering usually has a sort of rock, paper, scissors thing going on. If you were paying close attention, you may have noticed that each main archetype has a good matchup against one other archetype and a worse matchup against another. 
Aggro is good against Control and bad against Midrange and Combo. Midrange and Combo are good against Aggro, but bad against Control. And Control is good against Midrange and Combo, but bad against Aggro. Again, this is very general and will change depending on the metagame. In some metas, this flowchart reverses or just doesn't apply at all for whatever reason. However, this is a good general rule to keep in mind to help you figure out what cards you might want to put into your sideboard or what you might want to focus on in a game. Aggro decks may want a sideboard removal for the best mid-range threats or a few bigger, stickier threats to help them in the mid-game against mid-range decks. Mid-range decks often sideboard stickier threats and things like hand attack or protection spells to keep their threats alive against control. And control decks will often sideboard extra early game board wipes and life gain cards helping them survive slightly longer against aggro. Of course, your entire sideboard shouldn't just be dedicated to helping you against your worst matchup, because you don't ever want to over-sideboard and make your deck worse on accident. So, these are the main archetypes in Magic, but there are a few decks that have popped up over the years that fit outside of these rules and occupy their own special archetypes. The main reason that these are considered outside the standard archetype paradigm is that they need a specific meta to be able to thrive, and sometimes don't pop up in certain metagames or standard rotations because the card pool just doesn't fit their specific needs. A really good example of this is Tempo decks. Tempo decks are kind of like aggro decks, but they focus more on disrupting their opponent's plays. Tempo decks seek to play a lot of early game threats and put out a lot of damage quickly, like aggro decks, but then, instead of having maybe a few 4 or maybe 5 drops to finish the game off, they play a lot of cheap interaction to stop their opponent from developing their board or removing their threats. I would say that Mana War is sort of a mascot of Tempo decks. Mana War allows you to simultaneously develop your own board while stopping your opponent from doing the same. However, characteristic of an aggro strategy, it doesn't give you any card advantage, meaning that Tempo decks often have the same problem as aggro decks of running out of steam in the mid to late game. You could say that Tempo decks are a sub-archetype of aggro decks, but it's kind of an arbitrary distinction anyway. One thing worth noting is that most Tempo decks include blue, which is rarely seen in aggro decks. The four other colors of magic pretty often get good efficient beaters, but one of blue's biggest weaknesses as a color is having to work much harder to get its beaters. This is why Timbo decks are a little rare, especially in standard. The cards that help make Timbo possible aren't always in the format, and there isn't always enough of them available to make a deck work. This is true about all of the archetypes we'll mention here. They all only show up in specific conditions, and there isn't always the card pool necessary to support them. Timbo decks are usually better against instant and sorcery based answers because they have the counter magic to stop these effects from resolving, but they have a lot of the same weaknesses as other aggro decks, and mid range decks usually have a good matchup against them. The next slightly rarer archetype is Prison or Stacks. Prison is not the same as Control, though a lot of newer players make this mistake. Prison decks seek to make it harder or impossible for their opponent to play the game at all. They play a lot of cards that increase the cost of cards or that restrict game actions players can take. Cards like Blood Moon, Chalice of the Void, Ensnaring Bridge, and Sphere of Resistance are the type of cards you'd see in a Prison deck. Prison decks are incredibly meta-dependent, more so than any other archetype mentioned so far, because the power of their stacks effects are completely dependent on what your opponent is playing. Cards like Leon and Arbiter are incredibly powerful specifically because so many decks rely on fetch lands in modern, so taxing them can be backbreaking. A single change in the meta can completely stop a prison or stacks deck from working. For example, when Arkham's Astrolabe came out, it completely invalidated all stacks decks, as cards like Blood Moon and Leon and Arbiter no longer prevented the opponent from getting their mana, to such a degree that it got banned from both modern and legacy. Saying what matchups prison decks are good into is too too meta dependent to be generalized. It's pretty much based exactly on what their stacks pieces happen to be good against in that meta. And the final deck archetype we'll be talking about today is the ramp deck. Ramp decks seek to play a lot of effects like Lana or Elves in rampant growth to get a lot of mana quickly and then slam expensive threats into play early. Ramp decks are almost always good against mid-range decks who can't compete with the raw power of their threats, and usually bad against combo decks who can play over the top of what they're doing. However, their matchup into aggro and control can change wildly depending on the format. Aggro decks can sometimes be very good against ramp, as they can kill them before they can play their expensive threats, but sometimes the ramp is fast enough that they can reliably get their threats out before they die and stabilize like a mid-range deck. Control decks can often be good against ramp decks because of their ability to answer their singular strong threats and grind out with card advantage, but sometimes the ramp threats are too sticky and hard to counter that control is a bad matchup. Most ramp decks are good against either aggro or control, but they sometimes have been good against both. And this can be a big problem. This situation is what led to Field of the Deck being banned in its standard format, as the deck could turn it on fast enough to outrun aggro decks, but control decks couldn't properly answer it. 
Combine that with the fact that mid-range decks had a bad matchup against ramp decks naturally, and combo decks didn't exist in that particular standard format, and you have a one-deck meta. Ramp decks really need to not have threats too powerful to ramp into, or ramp spells that are too efficient, because trying to prevent your opponent from getting that mana is too difficult, so the threats either have to not win the game on their own, or be slow enough that aggro can kill them first. And that is a quick overview of the majority of deck archetypes in Magic. If you have anything else you want me to cover in this series, or any suggestions for any other videos, leave a comment below. And if you have any custom cards to submit for the custom card review, email them to me in the email in the description. And as always, thanks for watching.